Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to uh, have you all. And I know some of you are attending and it, it's very early in the morning. So thank you for um, getting up early and, and being here with us. My name is Abigail Martin. I'm a research fellow at Stanford's Sustainable Finance Initiative. And I'm going to be moderating and, and doing the introductions uh, for today's SFI research forum. So we're gonna start with uh, our first presenter, Professor Tom Heller, who's the faculty director at the Sustainable Finance Initiative within the Door School, as well as the Charles and Nadine Shelton Professor of International Legal Studies at Stanford Law School. Um, Tom will be talking about uh, sort of the state of play in carbon markets today and also the implications for nature-based removals and um, effective climate outcomes in general. Uh, we'll then hand the mic over to Professor David Hayes to talk about some recent developments in U.S. governance for uh, greenhouse gas removal, looking specifically at MMRV systems. And then we will move into a series of presentations by Kate Marr, Brian Rogers, and Alexandra or Lexi Ringsby, looking at various case studies in the design of um, MRV for open systems. Finally, we'll end with Mark Ronston, who is our own uh, senior scholar at SFI, who will be looking at uh, uh, discussing some of the pathways to a functional carbon market uh, with regard to removals. And then we'll pause, as I mentioned, the recording and begin our discussion of the presentations. So with that, I will welcome Tom Heller to get us started with um, his discussion of carbon markets and nature-based removals uh, and this research agenda at SFI in particular. So let me begin and I'll try and keep this um, relatively short because a fair amount of what we're going to say pertains to papers that we have published and, and those papers are available. Um, but I'll try and summarize in, in order to set the background for why we are focusing so much of our attention, um, not just on the changing state of play with regard to removals of carbon from the atmosphere, um, but in fact, on innovative removals from carbon in uh, from the atmosphere um, as a central feature of our work. And in order to, to provide that background, let me just suggest that what we are seeing at the present time, as illustrated by the slide that you see um, in front of you, I hope, um, there is increasing awareness and focus on um, voluntary carbon markets um, that are uh, being discussed um, and projected with, with extreme um, levels of growth in order to deal with the commitments and um, to net zero and other pledges that countries have made. But at the same time, um, we are seeing, and if you just flip the, um, there's a slide over, uh, Abigail, to the next one, um, that, um, that we, we're we all familiar with the set of scandals and various patches and fragmentations that uh, are afflicting uh, both prices and volumes in, in the carbon markets as, as the uh, projected demand grows larger and larger. And I really would like to uh, leave you with three points uh, in, in, in my remarks. Um, the first is that uh, we have managed to create uh, a, 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 a quite a bizarre system of, of demand for assets, um, as well as uh, a, a very gameable system of the supply of assets that are available to a point, I think, um, that is probably not able to be patched uh, although there are many efforts at the present time to figure out patches to deal with these problems as the scandals occur. And I'll come back to that in just a second. The second point that I'd like to make, and this is one that we have spent a good deal of time writing about um, under the rubric of, of e-liabilities and emissions liability management um, for on papers that, that, that are uh, fortunately available, is that 
strangely enough, as we come closer and closer to exhausting the carbon budgets that um, scientists, whether in the IPCC or working independently, um, have developed a fair consensus about, um, as those carbon budgets become exhausted, it provides an opportunity for us, if not a demand or not a, 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 a prerequisite, that we simplify this system that we have developed and are trying to patch in the carbon markets um, to, uh, to, to a much more manageable uh, arrangement that is consistent with what is being traded um, in, in carbon markets and the um, at, at this point the exhausted carbon budgets that 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 we will have used up in a relatively short time at the current rates uh, of of emissions um, and and the third point that I'd like to make which certainly I will leave largely to mark to um, to to uh, elaborate uh, the work and our, our the insights that we have is that as you move to this simplified system, the key number, um, the central um, definer of liability in the in the in the uh, in, in a properly accountable system becomes the um, the cost of innovative um, uh, removals. Um, and that's because of a series of features that are, um, associated with projected country budgets uh, that presumably add up in a to 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 a net zero structure, and and these projected budgets actually will absorb as countries are currently projecting what they uh, think their own carbon action is going to be. They will use up very very large amounts of what we might call a non-innovative or essentially uh, removals that are associated with uh, the reforestation or afforestation of, of, of land that has been uh, in the whole deforested in the past. As those emissions or as those removals associated with, with forest cover, um, are, are needed in order to deal with uh, country obligations. It's really the removals that we will talk about in this, in, in this um, uh, seminar, the innovative removals that will be um, the, the, the available vehicles, I'd say, to, to offset um, remaining uh, carbon combustion um, in in and in the net zero state. So let me uh, just make a couple of points about the current system um, that we are playing around with and creating so much uh, uh, furor both on the demand and the and the supply side. The the first point I would like to to emphasize is that offset trading has been present in the carbon markets. Um, since all the way back in 1992 at Rio and in Kyoto in 1997, um, in 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 particularly in, at at the beginning at the these car the the traded carbon were seen as temporary vehicles uh, to be to be uh, put into the system largely through the clean development mechanism. Uh, the first real form of trading along with something now archived called joint implementation. And these temporary vehicles were to be used um, until there was a universal obligation um, uh, to and, and an allocation of carbon obligations under an explicit carbon budget. In other words, there were most of the world in the earliest formulations of climate action uh, involved budgets or, or limitations on emissions only for a small number of advanced industrial economies. It was clear that other countries were expected over time to, to assume liabilities that limited their emissions. But until that time came, the low cost opportunities to reduce emissions in, um, in, in countries without explicit budgets. 
um, led to the design of these of these trading instruments. Um, and that operated for some time, basically until the Copenhagen negotiations uh, uh, collapsed the initial period of multilateral treaty formation uh, in 2009. Um, one of the features that occurred in conjunction with the collapse of the uh, Copenhagen negotiations was that the CDM was collapsed as well because it was subject to, to tremendous gaming and, and under regulation. On the other hand, in recent years, we've seen a large increase again in the, in the, in the use of, of, of carbon markets for a number of reasons. Perhaps the one that is cited most often is that the financial obligations that were initially built into the uh, carbon system that um, involved transfers of finances, public finances principally, but, but increasingly focused on, on private financial transfers. Um, and the carbon markets became re-justified in a way as pr providing uh, principally financial, uh, private financial transfers to, uh, to the South that were otherwise being underfunded. And, and that remains a, um, a, a principal discussion at the present time. But in addition, we now have in, in quite recent times recognition of the importance of other ecological services, principally biodiversity perhaps, um, gets the most attention. Um, and the, the result of this is that um, the, there, there are increasing uh, desires to have rates of exchange between various other ecosystem services um, that would then become funded through carbon markets. This creates particular problems in trading. Um, and um, But there's no question that it has, um, again, inflated concern about these markets. And, and, and finally, um, I think that the, uh, we, we are seeing this focus in good part because of the oddities of the way in which we are doing carbon accounting, particularly the carbon accounting uh, associated with, with scope three um, uh, reporting uh, or disclosure uh, of, of ESG generally or, or E and climate in particular. And, and we have developed a, a very large um, industry, if you will, of 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 uh, people and organizations who are essentially uh, engaged in 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 doing this this disclosure work, um, and and um, this has created uh, a particular focus on 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 carbon markets and and transition narratives because the markets are seen as a um, a, a way of meeting. What is um, what are 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 very high and somewhat bizarre counting of emissions, such that that it creates a demand for um, for carbon trading in ways that um, reinforce the, the 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 bizarre character of the accounting itself. So so let me say something about that um, intersection between scope three. Um, uh, accounting as it's currently done, the apparatus that we have built um, around what are reportable or disclosed emissions for which there is some sense of necessary action and the importance of, of, of particularly voluntary carbon markets in, in solving that problem. Um, so um, where, we have, where we have gone with... Um, with our current accounting system is that scope three introduces a number of problems that we have uh, addressed in, in some of our prior work at SFI. Um, these include uh, multiple counting uh, of, of emissions uh, across the value chains that are being reported um, under scope three uh, with the consequence that the higher those numbers, the greater the demand uh, 
or what become cheap assets for sale under VC and under particularly the voluntary carbon markets. Um, this is inflated by the fact that um, you have basically the use of secondary data rather than primary data to determine what those scope three um, assets are. And so the result of all of this is you get a, uh, uh, a, a confused situation where in, in where we, we gradually see uh, concerns over the um, the accuracy of what is being reported and 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 what adds up uh, to to or doesn't add up to to global budgets, and we have demonstrated this in a number of ways. Um, you not only see uh, trading to deal with this inflated set of emissions for which responsibility is associated with the disclosure, um, but you generally have. Uh, a variety of, of, of phenomena such as we have talked about in the auto sector, where when you, um, when you begin to count the downstream emissions that some automobile companies are, are, are using uh, to, to offset their, um, their inflated uh, numbers, what we see is basically emissions that are associated um, or, or carbon markets, uh, carbon um, uh, assets uh, that are associated and reported that are um, not removals at all. They are mostly about avoided emissions um, or, or forest conservation, which expands the supply to meet this inflated demand. Um, and very often, since there are limited budgets available for dealing with climate within any a uh, private actor reporting under scope three, what they really need are large numbers of cheap assets. Um, and those cheap assets um, then become um, the, 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 the drive, the demand for cheap assets becomes the, the driver of, um, uh, of, of, the, of the supply that is allowed to come into the markets. So we now see more and more the focus of attention on disclosure plus transition plans that are being made, uh, that are being uh, set up by, by private actors, corporate actors, uh, whether in the financial sector or in the real economy. And, and the response in the various plans are that we see the, um, the, uh, the, the narratives of what corporations are doing supplied by the increasing use of, re of, of renewable energy, which for economic reasons, shifts in relative prices, has become more and more available uh, in, in uh, particularly in the advanced industrial countries uh, where these reporting obligations are taken seriously. Um, we see um, long-term business plans restructuring around low carbon, production methods, but those plans generally are, are quite indeterminate in exactly how these newer technologies, whether they are sustainable aviation fuels or whether it is green hydrogen, um, that becomes the long-term um, avoidance of emissions. We see very little specificity about exactly how, when, or with what degree of diffusion these uh, these these um, uh, technology gains um, are being uh, projected into the future. And so what we have at the present time are limited short-term uh, uh, opportunities for, uh, for, for changing business operations um, that are inconsistent with the uh, emissions being reported in the short and medium term. And it's that gap that the voluntary carbon markets are expected to uh, fulfill um, in order to get some consistency between the carbon budgets that are necessary to, to, to bring carbon uh, damage functions under some control um, and, and, and what companies are actually able to do um, in, in the short run.
VCMs or various forms of carbon offsets are critical in this sense in order to deal with the relatively short and medium term emissions that cannot be changed under rapid changes of production methods. And so these become substitutes in effect for um, decarbonization um, in, the, um, in, in the short to medium run under most of the transition plans that we see being used. The consequence of this is that we see a proliferation of VCMs and we see all of the difficulties that, that are currently the source of these scandals. Uh, there, is, there is certainly fraud. Um, Mark and I were not very long ago in, in the, the Zimbabwe restorations or reforestation restorations that aren't happening are a good example of that. But Mark and I were relatively recently in Australia. And what we saw was trading in activities that had no scientific uh, basis in effect for uh, for for uh, dealing with the offsetting the the impact of carbon that was being released into the atmosphere and justified by the uh, offset mechanisms that were uh, then paired with the continuing emissions. Uh, these were simply cases where you have uh, essentially desert environments um, with with periodic rainfall. Uh, when that rainfall comes, of course, you get a sprouting of vegetation, which absorbs carbon out of the atmosphere. But if, as soon as the cycle ends and, and, and drought sets in again, that vegetation dies. And yet these things were being traded in spite of the fact that scientifically, um, it was clear that, that, that they had no long-term impact that was in any way um, correlated or able to offset emissions that were justified by these offsets um, and those emissions that would last for hundreds, if not thousands of years in the, in the damage that they would create to the, to the general atmosphere. So what we see beyond fraud is we see a, a great many assets that are being traded that are basically cannot be um, accurately measured. Um, and uh, or or put through through low error MRV monitoring reporting and verification standards. We'll talk about some of those during the work that we're doing. We see many assets that are being uh, created and traded uh, be, in which the as the the duration of the asset is relatively short term, um, but the damage function that is being offset is 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 long term it's quite interesting that in the newest um uh, emissions carbon trades that have been just in the past week or two put forward by one of the standards organizations the ICVCM that um the the emissions that they are saying can be offset are all very short term uh, they are either methane, which is a, a, a complicated structure in itself, or certain um, um, F gases, CFC gases. In other words, they're trying to deal with by by with the with the duration problem of 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 carbon offsets by saying we are only we only will allow for the moment at least offsets that are consistent with. Um, with uh, uh, emissions that do not remain in the atmosphere for very extended periods of time, avoiding the issues of CO2 where duration is clearly a, a, a much more serious issue. Um, it's also interesting that some of the initial approvals of so-called high quality assets to deal with the perceived scandals of, of much of what is being traded um, in many cases are do not involve actual transfers to uh, to the to the global south or third world countries, because if you are dealing with the offsets of of CFCs um, or or F gases or even methane, they they are often not properly accounted for even in the industrial advanced industrial countries. David will have something I think to say about that. Um, but um, 
the 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 one of the justifications that is given for uh, international offset trading, namely the transfers of of resources from north to south, doesn't character doesn't necessarily characterize much of the first uh, activities that have been approved. Um, but maybe the most serious problem of all, and this is really where I'd like to put um, our emphasis, is that um, at the present time there are enormous incentives um, to expand carbon budgets in general on the sale side. And what we see more and more are um, conversions of, of, of uh, carbon action into assets rather than the liabilities that we might initially associate them with. And by that, I simply mean that there is a tendency to expand the global carbon budgets by saying that the only way we will stop emitting is to be paid not to emit. In other words, you try and turn what otherwise would be a liability associated with emitting carbon into the atmosphere that we associate with most environmental pollution into an asset in which you basically keep growing the carbon budget by uh, well past what, what science estimates it can tolerate um, by, by um, essentially turning conservation of forests or avoided emissions um, into assets that will only be realized um, through sales rather than through um, treating these as liabilities themselves. We have a long history of uh, of of trying to deal with this through through the the confusing term of additionality, where we try and basically restrict carbon supplies uh, or supplies of carbon credits by pointing to the fact that they may have been supplied under normal market conditions uh, or that past behavior, uh, such as rates of deforestation, uh, allow you to continue emitting um, or the question of what is the relationship between regulation or most increasingly at the present time between pledges that you are that we're going to move to net zero um, or other ways to to pledge that the countries are um, taking carbon action when in effect um, what um, what all of these things are about are attempts to cut down, the tendency to turn what presumably might be liabilities in other um, ecological areas into assets that 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 can be sold. Um, what we see and what we're doing uh, in in trying to deal with this is we are looking very carefully at these various types of of attempts to create high quality market through patches. We are looking at. Um, Thing in the in the nature based uh, solutions areas, land carbon stock areas, we're looking at uh, methodologies like arc tr arc trees um, as ways of trying to limit the um, conversion of 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 uh, carbon liabilities into assets um, in the area of of uh, avoided emissions on in the in the combusted area uh, the co combustion of fuels. We're looking at the emissions translate uh, transition accelerator, um, and and what it will allow to be counted as a reduction um, in a creditable reduction in in emissions. Um, but the main points that we are seeing is that in order to try and limit the scope of trading uh, in this quest for high quality assets, that the 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 qualification the terms and conditions. Um, just get more and more and more complicated. There are various restrictions on jurisdictional trading, on trying to deal with improving systems um, performance, to deal with social costs and, and of displacement in a low carbon transition, and very importantly, in country transition plans. There must be country transition plans in order to qualify um, a, a, a jurisdiction sales um for for um for offset uh eligible trading and oh. yet if we look at these country plans we find that most of them are insubstantial 
Um, they allow for very, very substantial over combustion of fuels over the over the the the, the next period. Uh, they have extremely uh, extensive carbon stock increases, basically associated with reforestation, afforestation, and biofuels um, that are that are designed to offset their allocation in in combusted fuels. Um, that oh, my, have already I, committed I, to making. Uh, um, therefore, and I'm going to stop in just one second. Therefore, we get um, a, a, a situation where, in effect, they have already nationalized the uh, the stock of of reforestation assets, um, putting us into a situation where, if those assets are already being used for 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 country plans, we need to turn to what I described as engineered or innovative removals in order to um, to to have. Uh, uh, any kind of approximation to net zero. The result of all of this is we have created a system where the supply of assets is being gained through uh, creating more um, uh, assets than uh, tradable assets than um, are consistent with carbon budgets. But the demand for assets is also artificially inflated by counting assets over and over under scope three. And in effect, we have created a bizarre match of paper trading that is going on where short-term um, assets are supposed to be added up against long-term liabilities. Um, and where we are in all of this is, is, is anybody's guess. The result of, of all of this is that we need to have a different system of what counts as a carbon asset, what is tradable, and it must be aligned with carbon budgets in a way that is um, not the case at the present time. We'll turn back to these questions when, when in, in Mark's discussion, and I apologize for going over at the, in, in describing what is a chaotic situation uh, at present, which every time anyone tries to patch it in some fashion, they create complications that essentially make the goal, make the situ the the, uh, the situation non administrable um, or gameable on the other side in ways that are 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 very likely to continue. Um, and the more we inflate demand, the more we're going to inflate supply and trading in in inconsequential uh, markets. Thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to 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 David. Thanks, Tom. Sorry to uh, thank you, Tom. I'll just yeah. do a cool. quick uh, introduction to you, David. Uh, David is uh, the professor of practice at Stanford Law School and within the Door School of Sustainability. He has a very extensive career focused on environmental energy and natural resource law, and he most recently served as in the White House as special assistant to the president for climate policy. Um, and uh, uh, an illustrious career prior to that at, at NYU and, and other uh, organizations. So, um, David, I'll hand it over to you uh, to uh, share with us your views on uh, governance within the U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, thanks very much, Abby, uh, and thank you, Tom. Uh, I think Tom laid out very effectively um, the the many challenges uh, we have in terms of uh, uh, how to get to net zero uh, and create mechanisms that will uh, honestly and carefully and precisely to the extent as possible uh, uh, measure the downward uh, movement of the graph in terms of overall greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. Um, and there's a lot of focus, uh, understandably so, given all the problems that have we've seen in the voluntary carbon markets and 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 trading systems under the UN uh, charter, a um, lot of focus on the fact that we need to have better measurement, monitoring, reporting, and verification of actual emissions or removals. There's a big attention obviously now on removals and a big fo an important focus of this webinar on removals because um uh we we looked to removals as as an area a subset of of potential 
uh, uh, positive movement in this area uh, where we solve the problems we hope of additionality, of permanence and measurability by focusing on a context in which we know for a fact that new investments uh, in removal technologies will uh, remove uh, quantities of carbon uh, from the air uh, and we can prove it and we can quantify it. Um, what we're finding, however, is that uh, that that measurement uh, and uh, can be difficult and expensive and and very lo much looking forward to um, the discussions that will will follow mine about uh, the important research going on at Stanford in this area. I want to give just a top line policy development context for MMRV, uh, generally speaking, because uh, there, there is and there will be more focus on MMRV as a foundational area where we need to make progress and need to come together as scientists and policymakers uh, to agree upon uh, how to measure and uh, how to verify uh, and also how to share information generated in connection with measuring, monitoring, and verifying carbon emissions reductions and carbon uh, removals. Um, quick point, I worked, uh, when I was working in the White House, um, uh, our Climate Policy Office uh, prepared our nationally determined contribution for the president. Um, I looked on the land side in particular because of my ex prior experience uh, in the prior administrations and, and on land issues through the Department of the Interior and elsewhere. And I was reminded about how uh, poor our our information is about uh, carbon sequestration occurring on, on different landscapes. Uh, that that led to, along with other elements that, that went into our NDC, a recognition in the White House that, that we need a new system uh, to uh, uh, identify uh, good technologies to measure and monitoring, uh, uh, agree upon protocols, uh, provide information for a lot of different use cases, uh, not only the EPA national inventory for the UN, but also for many other decision makers um, and new ways to make sure we're exchanging and sharing in a public way the information that's being developed. That is what led to uh, the, uh, uh, the national strategy to advance an integrated U.S. greenhouse gas measurement, monitoring and information system. Uh, great acronym here. Uh, uh, actually shortened to to MMIS. Um, uh, this this national strategy document, uh, which Phil Perry, uh, rather Phil Duffy, who's on the uh, uh, the webinar here, uh, worked on with me, and then saw through to the end to to uh, get it out last November, identifies five national objectives uh, for greenhouse gas uh, MMIS. One is to improve activity level bottom up quantification. And under the key themes on the right, this is really, I think, the essential core of the MMIS concept, which is we need more precise data at the activity level. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, the collective we, if you will, in the climate area of, of knowing what's going on in the atmosphere in terms of concentrations of different greenhouse gases. Uh, we have not been focused uh, until relatively recently very much about what's happening uh, on the ground in specific uh, for specific emission sources for specific practices that are being changed in order to reduce emissions uh, and and or uh, uh, provide removals. Uh, so the the activity the the, the uh, MMIS national strategy is very focused on bottom up quantification with an idea of then. Uh, certainly continuing to improve the atmospheric top-down quantification and have a convergence. Uh, that's that's ultimately what's needed. There should be a roll-up of what we're doing on the ground uh, to uh, to match what's what we're seeing uh, in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, number four and number five national objectives are also incredibly important: uh, uh, improving latency, completeness, uh, uh, interoperability, and accessibility of greenhouse gas uh, data. And that really goes to, I think, the other second key theme I want to emphasize, which is the development of an information system uh, called for here in the national strategy for sharing data 
uh, and consistent with fairer principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, equitable, and responsible. Uh, and the reality is that we have no such system. Um, we do have good information on some greenhouse gases in particular, uh, CO2 emission sources in the US. We have excellent information uh, from power plants, from tailpipes, et cetera. That data is available through EPA, but it's essentially um, unusable uh, for decision makers because it's not presented in a way that that is that is meaningfully accessible. Uh, and one of the things that's happening right now in a positive way is there's there's a, a, a big focus on developing that, curating that information in, in, through a GIS format so that it's available at a, uh, uh, a scaled down way so that a mayor or a governor can understand what CO2 emission sources are in his or her jurisdictions and make good decisions around it. But it, when it comes to nature-based solutions, when it comes to methane, other greenhouse gases that have not historically had the attention that say CO2 emissions have, no regulatory activity around it or very little, uh, and no, no incentive to do place-based, uh, practice-based information development, uh, we have a big problem. And we have an opportunity as well, because with a lot of new data coming in, there's there's the potential that it is made available, more public source, open source, made interoperable with common definitions so that and, and API so it can be brought together and made accessible. But we have no system or uh, to to facilitate the discussions that will make that happen. Uh, nor is there a, a, a sort of a central hub that can uh, that can manage this process needed to create uh, a big platform of open source data available at the uh, activity level in addition to the atmospheric level. And obviously, there needs to be number five support for science based standards to make make all of this uh, uh, work. And uh, another key theme, of course, is linkage to international efforts. And I'm I'm hopeful that that uh, the national strategy can provide the vessel for the U.S. to uh, jump ahead in the MMRV area and help show the way for develop protocol development, uh, information sharing, et cetera, that can then be uh, picked up uh, uh, internationally. Um, so the 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 White House is very serious about this. Uh, the National Climate Advisor. Uh, Ali Zaidi has been personally very involved. John Podesta, who's new, who's now our international uh, climate lead for the president, as well as the uh, Inflation Reduction Act implementation lead, very personally involved. The Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, is really the hub of this uh, effort. We have Ben Poulter, who's the new deputy head of the MMRV effort in the White House on this webinar. His new boss just started uh, this week. Um, Ron Cohen uh, from uh, Berkeley as a climate scientist is leading the effort. Uh, 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 Phil Duffy is involved as well. The Climate Policy Office uh, with Melinda Sepp is very involved, as is OMB, as is John Podesta's office. Um, so this is, this is an exciting time, actually. They are moving out. This is very unusual for the White House to, to develop 100% implementation within the White House for a government-wide effort that, that now needs to be brought into action. The initial focus is going to be, uh, we hope and expect, on priority use cases. We've got two in very interesting use cases uh, that, uh, that are being advanced right now. One in the northern grasslands, dealing with climate sequestration and methane, uh, that's being developed by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in conjunction with the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Uh, we also have a very... Uh, interesting and important uh, reforestation initiative uh, that the American Forest is working on uh, with the uh, U.S. Forest uh, Service and others. I know we have some re-green folks on the line and welcome Marcelo and your colleagues. Uh, we have much to learn from Brazil and what re-green is doing down there. We're hoping for an early use case on methane uh, and and early attention on how we can create more data accessibility and data sharing mechanisms. I will just mo uh, mention parenthetically, as I think Kate and her uh, uh, and and her students might. Uh, there there are problems in term in in terms of the the fact that there's not been a serious sort of 
government slash policy overlay on the research that's going on. There, there are problems in that some some of the folks who are innovating in this area are keeping their data uh, and claiming IP for it and not sharing it, which is 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 not going to work uh, uh, long term for for what we need to do here. Uh, there's uh, uh, Ben actually just called me yesterday about uh, a forestry workshop that he's putting together for late June to illustrate the uh, implementation, bringing together a lot of folks from the academy, from NGOs, from government, et cetera, to, to come up with a work plan, basically, to help implement uh, the national strategy. And there's an outside coalition forming that uh, Jason Burnett, Burnett, chair of the uh, Packard Foundation and also uh, CEO of Crosswalks Lab and I are are uh, leading and working with the Data Foundation uh, and Ryan Alexander and Nick Nick Hart of the Data Foundation. Um, so, in addition, this MMRV, uh, the national strategy, is in a broader context uh, that that Tom alluded to. Uh, that's uh, that 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 we hope can come together. And with with the help of Stanford and many others, including many of you on the uh, on this webinar, can 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 make real progress in addressing this fundamental lack of foundational data and architecture that will uh, infuse confidence uh, in uh, assertions regarding emissions reductions and removals. We obviously have the the structure of the EPA National Greenhouse Gas Inventory and the agency's obligations to essentially do the equivalent of a nationwide inventory uh, every year. <clears throat> but that, frankly, is not based on uh, on the practice-based concept, the activity level concept rolled up into a national inventory. So we need to really go far, much farther than that traditional approach, although EPA clearly is, is, a, is a key player in in that, uh, in our ambition in that regard. Recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the White House endorsed the notion of high integrity voluntary carbon markets. Um, uh, and interestingly, in that White House statement, uh, endorsing uh, the notion of, of improving voluntary carbon markets by insisting on high integrity credits, the White House pointed to this uh, national MMIS initiative. It also pointed to uh, the, the uh, developing activity under the Growing Climate Solutions Act, the, that next bullet, where the USDA is agreeing as pushed by Congress to start uh, evaluating and, and blessing, we hope, specific protocols uh, that uh, will in, in include solid measurement, monitoring, and verification approaches for specific forestry and agricultural practices. This is, this is, this is one of the biggest challenges for uh, the MMRV uh, initiative in the U.S. and at the federal level, which is how can we create consensus-based protocols that uh, breathe in good technology that address issues like the uncertainty issues that will be discussed here shortly, um, and that involve the sharing, uh, publicly sharing of outcomes and data in a way that collects data from multiple sources that are doing similar data development and modeling in for s s uh, 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 the same types of practices. Uh, we're going to have a, a test drive of that, if you will, early on with agriculture and forestry uh, through the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And uh, you've got, of course, a lot of energy department attention on CDR in particular, uh, and also private company interest in CDR uh, in particular. So what are the protocols that are going to be expected uh, for grantees who receive uh, uh, funds to proceed with innovative uh, and not so innovative uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and, and to the extent those are land-based CDR programs, will the Energy Department and the U.S. Department of Agriculture agree on those protocols and how will that happen? Uh, which is the final point. We're very excited to have the White House uh, leading in this effort.
uh, this has to happen out of the White House because different agencies take different approaches, uh, and the 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 uh, the what we need is for all of this to come together uh, in an effective way uh, in the coming months um, and uh, and in the coming years. Uh, this is this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to require a a concerted effort and investment in this foundational uh, data and evidence-based information that will, that uh, has the potential, I believe, and firmly uh, so, has the potential to help address the, the dysfunctionality that we're seeing and the, that Tom so eloquently uh, reviewed uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I'm, I have to apologize. I'm going to have to drop uh, to join a, uh, a call for a board that I'm, a, uh, uh, that I'm on and uh, uh, we'll look forward to uh, listening afterwards uh, to the uh, uh, sessions that follow. Thank you very much. Thanks, David, uh, for that very clear talk on the data and architecture needs for not just MMRB, but also functional carbon markets. We're going to turn now to Professor Kate Marr from the Department of Earth System Science uh, at Stanford University and also a senior fellow at the Woods Institute. Uh, Kate is an expert on the carbon cycle and uh, is at the forefront of research that links together hydro hydrologic, chemical, and biological processes to understand uh, carbon sequestration strategies. She's received many honors and awards for her work um, on these topics, including the prestigious James B. Uh, McElwain Medal from the AGU, the American Geophysical Union. And she is joined by two of her PhD students, uh, and I will let her introduce Alexandra and, and Brian in turn. Uh, but Kate, um, uh, thank you for uh, taking over from here. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you, Abby, for that introduction. And as Abby mentioned, I've spent a lot of my career studying the natural analogs to some of the nature-based solutions we're trying to accelerate. And it's been both humbling to see how when we try to quantify carbon transformations and transport, how many scientific uncertainties are daylighted that we just didn't actually know or hadn't thought about. Um, but it's also been very motivating to, to think about how we take the knowledge that we have gained over decades of studying things like mineralization, soil weathering, and, and soil organic carbon and apply them into this new context. And so what I want to do today is just share a little bit about our, our bigger picture thinking around the MRV needs for nature-based climate solutions. And then really turn it over to Lexi and Brian, who are two PhD students who have been doing the really hard work of figuring out how to, to take the science and technology and, and harmonize it with the finance and policy that, that David, Tom, and, and Mark have, have been speaking about. Um, so I'll, I'll start off briefly with just a little bit of context about Stanford in general. And um, I think everyone knows we, we started a new school, which has been really exciting. And I think it's it's achieved two things. It's really created a, a, a spotlight on sustainability research on campus and constantly interacting with people from engineering, humanities, social sciences, who really wanna pivot their research towards working on sustainability problems. And so that that spotlight has also just catalyzed a lot of new initiatives. And I just wanted to, to quickly highlight two that I think are really relevant in this, this context. Um, and one is a new initiative called Taking the Pulse of the Planet, which is really about building this global network of sensors, satellites, capabilities, the modeling and data platforms that are needed to make sense of all of that, that data that comes in from, from the ground and from space. And we have three key areas within taking the pulse. So one focus is freshwater, one focus is oceans, and the third focus is relevant to this conversation, which is about how do we do MRV? How do we get the resolution of, of spatial measurements that we need to, to really quantify how much carbon is being stored and how much carbon um, is being released back to the atmosphere? And so this is an exciting initiative that we're moving forward, thinking about building a sensor garage or a maker space to build new sensors and test them, as well as developing some test bed sites hopefully in partnership with some project developers on the CDR side where we can actually start to deploy and understand how some of these technologies can, can really enhance our ability to measure systems. And then a second initiative that's also growing is our sustainability data science initiative. And this is about 
trying to connect the amazing capacity we have in computer science with our sustainability researchers and figure out, you know, how do we discover things from data? How do we also make sense of data? And so um, there's a fellows program that really works to connect the students and, and, and postdocs across the campus, as well as the faculty. And then also the opportunity for people to pitch projects. So if there's a data set that's challenging, um, there's a summer program where people really dig in and explore, you know, how to, how to treat and think about some of these complicated data products. Um, so those are some of the things we're, we're bringing in. And I think the important piece is that there's a there's an enormous groundswell of, of interest in working on these problems. And I, I think we might have Chris Field on the phone call who is also working on the forestry side of things and thinking about a lot of the same issues I'll be talking about for enhanced weathering and biochar. And you know, so in, in, in trying to pull together what we've heard from from talking to a lot of people, the, the students, Brian and Lexi, have done an amazing job of need finding and spoken to hundreds of people in industry and, and nonprofits to really think about what do we need MRV to do? And we've kind of come up with this list of criteria we think is really important. So the first one is time dependence. And when we think about open systems, they're variable temporally, they're variable in space. And so we need to honor that as we think about how to quantify them and how to transition them into assets. And so we think that time dependence should be both predictable. We should know when we start a project, what's the arc of carbon storage and carbon removal, and it should be verifiable. We should be able to go in and test that that prediction was, was, was relevant. Um, of course, standardization is already happening. We've been reviewing the standards that exist um, for both biochar and enhanced weathering. And I'll, I'll show you an example of, of how much variability there is in standard standards today, even for something like biochar, which is pretty dominant in the market. Um, and we also think that there should be multiple constraints. And this comes into play for some of these harder to measure carbon removal projects. Um, where you might need to, to look at two different types of constraints on the MRV. And then as David alluded to, we also think that the transparency should be there. It should be easy to go in and, and see the underlying calculations that were, were done. Um, in some cases, particularly for enhanced weathering, the, the original field data goes through a bunch of, of uh, conversions to end up with that final CDR number. And right now you can't tell where that final CDR number came from and we should be able to do that. And so I, I, I really think that we, we need to make sure that all the data and calculations are available and that everyone has equal access to those calculations and, and can draw their own conclusions from, from what's being presented. Um, and then of course, at the same time, we need cost effectiveness. And for some of these nature-based climate solutions, we could we could really measure over and over again, but that would cost a lot of money. And so we have to think about how can we, we be really targeted and optimizing the measurements. Which brings us to the, the last piece, um, which is very synergistic with what David talked about. In order to create that cost effectiveness, we really need federal government and or partnerships that can provide some of that underlying baseline data. This is really important for soils. We just don't have the data we need at the spatial resolution we need, and it would be really expensive to, to get it. And at the same time, it should be available to everyone to use for designing projects and making uh, CDR calculations. And so uh, we're talking to the USGS, I think later today, and I'm hoping that we can start to, to, to get some ideas around how we might build these baseline data sets. And so what Lexi and Brian will talk about are the, the two strategies that we've been really focused on within our group. Um, one is enhanced rock weathering. And we have brought together a lot of what our own research had, had, had highlighted about what happens during rock weathering. And so very briefly, rock weathering is the application of a silicate material. It can be a natural material like basalt rock, or it can come from places like uh, steel slag, which is a basically a silicate, very reactive silicate material. And when you put it on the soil, it dissolves and consumes CO2 by producing alkalinity. And so you can either have alkalinity that's produced and transported to the ocean where it forms calcium carbonate, or in some cases you can form carbonates directly in the soil. And, and so we've 
propose breaking this into two stages. Um, one is the near field zone where we think we can actually measure things pretty well. This would be the upper one meter of a soil. And then what we call the far field zone. And this is where that groundwater is being transported through a groundwater system to a stream. This is much harder to, to measure and track. Um, and so we want to we want to break it apart in terms of the, the difference between the two and really think about where the uncertainties are coming from, as well as where there's opportunities to, to optimize. Um, so this is a complicated diagram. I'm not going to walk through all the arrows, but just to give you a sense of these are actually all of the transformations that are happening that involve carbon within an enhanced weathering system. And so our ability to measure these is is what really reduces the uncertainty on the um, final CDR calculation. And so Brian will say a lot more about that, but you know, we think with enhanced weathering at the moment, there's a lot of market enthusiasm for it. The, the benefits of rock weathering are that it can scale with agricultural practices, it can replace fertilizer, it has soil health benefits. Um, the flip side is that it's not really clear to us that the CDR is actually measurable. And so this is a real challenge in terms of, we know this is something that works, but how do we measure it? Um, and then finally, you know, we're, we're thinking about at the moment, really trying to, to dig into this question of, of how is how measurable is CDR? And so Brian will talk a little bit about the work he's doing on solid phase depletion methods and models as tools to do this. Longer term, we think once we get these initial optimization uh, tools together, then we can start to look at, you know, what are ways to use different feedstocks which environments are most favorable, which crops, and are there additives that might be exciting to look at to just accelerate the rate at which you're removing carbon. Uh, so Brian will say more about rock weathering. And then the other area we've been really focused on is biochar. And I'm a huge fan of biochar. I think it's a really important strategy. It just has some challenges at the moment that I think uh, the community really needs to, to work to resolve. And one of the problems right now is the durability metric. And so what you're seeing here is a, a recent compilation of, of biochar H to C measurements that have been converted into a permanent. And so this is basically the estimated amount of biochar that would be left after a hundred years in the soil. And so you can see there's an enormous amount of scatter in the data that underlies this durability estimate. One of the things that's interesting about it is if you look at the current standards and try to do a calculation, pick an H to C ratio and calculate what's the durability, you can get a whole range depending on the standard and what you assume for climate between like 50% and 90%. So that's an enormous range of potential durability estimates for nominally the same material. It's just how it's calculated. And so we've been thinking a lot about how to address this problem and we're still still thinking about it. One of the things we want to do is go back into this data and just start to build a time dependent model and look at the uncertainty if you actually take the underlying measurements and, and recast them. Uh, the other thing we're thinking about is how to develop a, a durability metric that that honors what is a, a complex material. But H to C ratio is probably not a good metric for durability in the first place. So how do we shift to something that really honors the nature of the material? Um, the other thing we've been working on is where does all the biomass come from to make biochar in the first place? And Lexi will say a little bit more about what she's been learning and thinking about with respect to the biomass market. And then finally, we've been doing a little bit of work on exploring how could you actually map soils and agricultural practices to look at predictive biochar deployment. And so these are kind of three different areas we're, we're working on. Um, and ultimately, we wanted to, to focus on how do we how do we bring together our understanding of feedstock availability, potential conversion methods, and soil health benefits to really optimize biochar deployment? And the, the way that we're thinking about this and the importance of this uncertainty aware MRV is, is, is shown here, and I think we'll come back to this in, in Mark's conversation. Um, these are just two hypothetical curves. They're entirely hypothetical in the data going in here. They're just guided by what we have seen in the existing data for, for both enhanced weathering and biochar. And so the y-axis is the cumulative CDR potential. So it's just normalized to what would be a, a perfect system uh, over time. And 
the important thing to, to notice is that the time dependence of these two strategies are entirely different and their uncertainty profiles are entirely different. Right now in the current VCM treatment, we just pick a time point, we measure, we're done, we don't revisit whether that measurement was correct. If you look at something like enhanced weathering, we think that the uncertainty will actually go down over time. And so if you actually um, you know, wait a couple of years, which is hard in the current market, but if you could wait a couple of years, you could actually really have a much more or much less uncertain asset. Um, conversely for biochar, because of this issue with the durability, we basically typically subtract 30% um, off the top and then just assume that was the right number. And so this is showing the, the current BCM treatment over time versus what we actually think is probably true for biochar. And so with biochar, you have this favorable early removal and then um, you know what's probably a, a less than efficient long-term removal. And so this is where we really want MRV to go because we think it will be compatible with a, a more robust way of, of, of tracking carbon. And one of the things that I think will become clear as Lexi and Brian talk is that the, the, the measuring capacity is going to be really important. And we think the technology and approaches for being able to, to build these uncertainty CDR curves is, is really critical. And so I'll stop there and turn it over to Brian. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian. Uh, my research focuses specifically on enhanced weathering and how we can use models and data science to, to scale this technology. So as, as Kate mentioned, a lot of these nature-based solutions are analogs to, to natural processes. Um, Silicate rock naturally weathers to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere over a million year time scales. So can we speed that up by spreading this silicate material at the surface and uh, allowing that to dissolve, accelerating the weathering? Right now, enhanced weathering makes up about 9% of CDR suppliers but only a little over 1% of purchases and a little over 1% of deliveries. And really the main obstacle here is, as, as we've mentioned several times, is there's poorly constrained uncertainty in the MRV techniques, and that is leaving critical knowledge gaps that's inhibiting any further scaling of enhanced weathering. So a, a very basic uncertainty that we, we still don't understand is whether current enhanced weathering deployments are even effective. And if 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 we can if we can get to that point, then we can start to look at other questions like how expensive is verification? Should enhanced weathering be restricted to certain climates or crops? And we can also ask more interesting questions about new technologies, like will specially engineered feedstocks be necessary, or could we use biological accelerants to help overcome the limitations? But first, just focusing on whether or not enhanced weathering is effective and, and how do we measure it. And the key piece of this will, will be quantifying uncertainty in the MRV approaches. Again, this, this will allow, this will reveal whether or not enhanced weathering is effective, but also enable cost uncertainty optimization. There are a lot of different ways to measure. Some are going to be more accurate, but maybe more expensive. So CD, um, carbon dioxide removal through enhanced weathering is reflected in these alkalinity and DIC fluxes, um, but there do not exist sensor technologies to directly monitor these fluxes. That would actually be a, a very cool partnership in uh, the sensor, sensor development landscape. But until those types of sensors are developed, current MRV approaches mainly use solid phase depletion to, to monitor uh, to predict CDR. So just monitoring the, the soil solids and, and how those change. There are also aqueous measurements that can be taken that will probably be really useful, um, but we still don't understand the value of, of these different types of measurements because they both have very unconstrained, unknown scientific and spatial uncertainty. So in the next two slides, I will talk about scientific and spatial uncertainty specifically and how we plan to address those. Regarding scientific uncertainty, we, we don't know how well feedstock dissolution actually reflects 
carbon dioxide removal? And are there are there other measures that that could be more useful or, or complementary to the solid phase depletion method? The objective here is to use reactive transport models and data science techniques to identify constraints on enhanced weathering and evaluate MRV components. So these reactive transport models, these are hydrologic and geochemical models. They were originally developed uh, about 30 years ago by the Department of Energy, originally for nuclear waste disposal. Um, but over the past three decades, they've been continually updated with more advanced processes and representations as our knowledge of the subsurface continues to advance. So what we have today is actually very sophisticated computational tools to model these, these extremely complex subsurface systems. And, and what we want to see is, is what can these models tell us about enhanced weathering? We can use these models to track specific MRV components. We can, this is, this. these graphs are showing feedstock dissolution over, over the course of a year and also the alkalinity increase over the course of a year. You'll see that these proxies are very, to, these signals are very different from each other um, and how representative are each of them of the actual CDR. The models take in so many parameters, 40 or 50 parameters, a lot of them are unknown. And we can address this uncertainty by, rather than putting in a specific value, we can put in ranges for these parameters. And then we can develop a CDR curve that's not just one specific line, but a range of likely CDR. What we can also do with these is we can push the model to predict like very little CDR or a lot of CDR and see which parameters are actually controlling that. And that will help identify limitations and maybe which, uh, which parameters would be most useful to measure. So that's how we plan to address the scientific uncertainty. There's also a lot of spatial uncertainty. So as, as I mentioned, we are, most MRV techniques monitor feedstock dissolution, but there are a lot of elements in the feedstock that are also in the background soil and very highly variable amounts. One of these elements is calcium. That's a pretty key component of both feedstock and uh, just baseline soil. On the right, what I have shown is four different uh, realizations of what calcium abundance could look like across a one hectare field. And all of these four realizations have the same variability. What's different across them is that they have different spatial correlations. So depositional processes may introduce some sort of spatial structure in these elements. If, it's, if the distribution of the elements is completely random, you won't need as many samples to capture that variability. But if there is some degree of spatial correlation, which there likely is, um, but we don't know how much spatial correlation there is, we're going to need more samples to actually capture that variability. That's kind of the importance of, of what Kate was mentioning on a national baseline in understanding how variable these elements are across the soil. So key questions are how much monitoring is needed to constrain this variability? How densely do you need to take the samples? How many? That could really dictate the cost and whether or not enhanced weathering is actually scalable. And how should this variability be accounted for in uncertainty calculations? The objective here is to develop a standardized uncertainty quantification framework to ensure rigor and transparency across suppliers. Right now, suppliers mostly do these calculations internally. Kate mentioned they're often protected by intellectual property. There are even some enhanced weathering companies that are kind of turning into MRV companies. And it's probably not great to have the verification within the companies actually performing the CDR. So having this external standardized analysis framework will be extremely, um, extremely useful and, and necessary to ensure honesty in the market. And lastly, I, I just want to leave with the perspective that we have that we have moving forward, um, which is that modeling and data science frameworks have significant and quite unrealized potential to rigorously account for uncertainty 
and be a very cost-effective component of MRV. So with that, I will hand it over to Lexi. Thank you. Um, as Brian has so eloquently discussed, uncertainty is kind of our favorite word these days in the Maher Group. And biochar faces many of the same problems as an open system CDR strategy. For those of you who, who are less familiar with biochar CDR, let's see if it will let me advance here. Um, biochar really uh, hails back to the early 2000s with some seminal work from researchers from Cornell who discovered um, really high fertility of typically unfertile soils in the Amazon basin, the Terra Preta soils. They discovered that human amended charcoal really enhanced soil fertility. And also that this charcoal that was amended very long ago uh, remained in the soil even today. The idea for biochar CDR is to leverage biology to capture ambient carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis really remains our, our cheapest and most efficient means to remove ambient carbon dioxide. The issue with photosynthetic processes, as we know, is that once the biomass that is captured carbon from the air dies, the CO2 is quickly re-released to the atmosphere. Biochar seeks to sort of extend that, the latter piece of that equation by transferring carbon fixed from photosynthesis into a more stable form. And to do so, we leverage thermochemical conversion processes, specifically pyrolysis, to reduce the bioavailability of carbon in biomass and sort of delay the re-release of CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, as I mentioned, in the terra preta soils, we saw really enhanced um, soil fertility. And we know that field amendment biochar does provide both storage of carbon and uh, confers agronomic benefits. Biochar is pretty much our only uh, technologically mature CDR strategy at present. Um, and that is the reason why um, biochar CDR represents the lion's share of, the, of delivered carbon removal. This pie chart here from the Mercer and Burke Policy Report published in 2023 emphasizes that. And we see that biochar here um, encompasses most of what we can deliver in, in CDR. I think that Q1 2024 is, Q1 of 2024 is much the same um, with biochar being the, the largest contributor to, contributor to what we can deliver as far as engineered carbon dioxide removal is concerned. That said, despite the promise of biochar CDR, um, we have a few concerns that, that continue to undermine the long-term potential of biochar. Um, and that relates back to this uncertainty problem. It's how permanent is biochar CDR? Uh, and secondly, we've been thinking, as Kate mentioned, more broadly about the role of biochar in the greater bioeconomy. And we'd like to understand what, what does the landscape for biomass look like in the future? What is the pull for different biomass products? Um, and how can we understand these things to, to move towards uh, a better functioning market for biomass uh, and carbon more generally? On this first piece of biochar permanence, um, it's intuitive that biochar permanence is fundamental to its CDR value, but unfortunately, we don't have a great handle on how long these materials will last. Um, this figure on the left-hand side here is a schematic diagram of different proposals for biochar permanence in soil. At the top here, you have folks proposing that biochar might last in soil for, for tens of years, you know, the decadal uh, time horizon based on some field trials and, and limited soil carbon modeling results. On the other side of the spectrum, folks have recently published on biochar um, as an inert night type material uh, using organic petrology methods. Uh, folks have asserted that the biochar should really last in soils, at least a large part of it, um, for thousands of years. In the middle here, we have what the voluntary mark carbon market has really hinged upon, um, some seminal work from Dominic Wolf published in 2021 and, and some amendments that were made earlier this year. Um, folks have proposed that based on some molecular marker proxies um, and their connection to incubation studies, the biochar should at least, a large portion of it should last uh, for, for 100 years or more. There's a couple of ways that we can, we can we currently measure biochar permanence in soil. We can use direct measurements. And I sort of have you know made the air quotes here because these measurements cannot be direct. We can't measure how much biochar will remain in soil in 100 years. The best we can do is short-term closed system lab incubation um, and short-term open system field studies. Um, these, these approaches are, are nice in principle, but they're necessarily biased to the fastest degrading components of biochar. It's, it's generally understood that biochar is a heterogeneous, porous, rich carbon solid that you know, looks like barbecue charcoal, um, but it has different components of reactivity within the material 
some components are faster at the gradient than others. And so these, these short-term experiments uh, are certainly biased towards whatever degrades most quickly. And um, whatever we assume from these, these short-term experiments ultimately gets extrapolated to 100 years. So you can immediately see that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty at the root of this direct measurement. A lot of work has been done in the past decade or so to develop indirect proxies for biochar durability. Uh, folks have focused primarily on ultimate analyses and elemental ratios in these charcoal materials, particularly the molar H to C and O to C ratio. The idea there that these molecular mark marker proxies um, are reflective of how, how well the material has been converted from the parent biomass to the charcoal material. Folks have also tried to develop uh, thermally and chemically, you know, accelerated aging techniques to understand what's likely to happen to these materials, both biotically and abiotically, once they're added to soils. Um, the, the challenge for indirect measurements is, well, first, we need to be able to correlate these indirect measurements to our so-called direct measurements. So we need to develop, you know, really robust data science techniques to, to, get, to connect these things. Um, and secondly, the challenge goes back to our, our, our initial uncertainty here surrounding the direct measurements. If our Indirect proxies are to be any good. We need our direct measurements to, to reproduce reality faithfully. We have sought to sort of iterate on these existing protocols um, with some fundamental and applied work. Um, we were seeking to develop paired stimulations and oxidative tests to understand fundamentally what the range of material reactivity is in these charcoals. And secondly, to um, work towards developing a standardized test um, there's some analogies to food preservative testing that we've made. Uh, we hope that we can potentially develop a more standardized and reproducible test to get a bit better handle on um, uncertainty and its implications for biochar CDR. The second piece that I mentioned is the role of biochar in the, in the larger bioeconomy. I think it's worth reminding us all that biomass resources are increasingly partitioned across a, a growing bioeconomy as we move away from fossil energy and fossil petroleum, we increasingly will rely upon raw materials in the form of biomass to produce products such as fuels, uh, materials, and chemicals. So biochar is really just one possible endpoint for biomass in this developing circular economy. So we've been thinking about a couple of questions related to biochar within this greater bioeconomy. We'd, we'd like to assess how we can best utilize our limited biomass resources and understand if biochar really is the product with the maximum social good. Um, I've seen you know, quite a bit of press recently on the use of biomass and sustainable aviation fuel. So we'd like to understand what is the landscape for potential endpoints and what's the best, best way that we can harness our biomass resources. Uh, as part of that, we need to understand how the demand for these different products will evolve uh, and, and concurrently, how will the supply of biomass for those products evolve and on the, the biomass supply side, we've been doing some work to understand what, what our current available biomass limitations are and how we might be able to overcome some of them to increase the available supply of biomass for biochar production. On the right-hand side of the slide here is a figure pulled from a recent um, spatially explicit assessment of global biomass potential and the, and the potential to produce biochar from that biomass. This waterfall plot first shows the global residue production, this is crop residues, um, primarily in, in units of gigatons of carbon per year. So we see that we have about two and a half gigatons available um, for, for biochar production. Currently um, in the US and elsewhere, we, we designate some fraction of biomass residues to be um, field amended. That is, we leave some fraction of crop residues on the field for soil health concerns. So this is this harvest loss piece ties to sustainable harvest guidelines. We have to leave some fraction of crop residues to prevent soil erosion and reduce the loss of soil organic carbon. Some fraction of biomass is already preordained for livestock. Um, this is primarily livestock feed. Then we're left with, with you know, a relatively small number for biochar production. If we can use all of the rest of, of that biomass that's available around the globe, we can, we can produce you know, a little under a half of a gigaton of, of sequestered biochar. We've become increasingly interested in this harvest loss piece, this sustainable harvest um, opportunity. Uh, we believe that you know, if, if biochar truly is an effective soil enhancer, then perhaps um, some of this biomass that's locked up in sustainable harvest guidelines could be available for biomass production, or biochar production rather. And if, if biochar production is, is the best means that we can 
um, leverage to improve soil health, then maybe this is, you know, some uncompetitive supply for biochar. Um, so, so with that, we're really, we're looking to sort of push against these, these sustainable harvest guidelines to understand if we can unlock more potential biomass for biochar. Um, and we'd like to also understand, you know, what these sustainable harvest guidelines and these, these biomass sources imply for um, the best design of biochar production systems. And so in line with that, we've also been thinking about the role of different production modes, specifically distributed versus centralized production schemes um, as we work towards a better functioning carbon market and, and a better functioning biochar market. Um, and I'll pass that out now, I guess, to Mark, who will be much better posed to, to speak on the biochar carbon market. What I want to do is try to uh, connect uh, you know, Tom's introduction with uh, Kate, Lexi, and Brian's uh, great discussions of what's going on in the world of uh, carbon markets. And I have to confess, I don't, oh, they're, they're moving it for me. Thanks. Let's just flip to the next slide to go quickly because I don't think I can, oh, thanks. So quickly, I want to talk about the difference between how carbon markets work and financial markets work. Um, this is at the core of how we are trying to approach problems in the carbon markets. On the left-hand side of this page, you see, you'll, you might recognize the font of the usual Guardian headlines because it always seems to be the Guardian. Um, revealed top carbon offset projects may not cut planet heating emissions. Big carbon credit certifier to replace its offset scheme. The whole problem here as, uh, as uh, Kate and um, Lexi and Brian discussed is that nature-based carbon removals are pretty darn risky, but the voluntary carbon market um, doesn't treat them as risky assets. So what happens in the voluntary carbon market is a project developer defines a project. They say, we're going to do the following activity to remove carbon from the atmosphere. The registry or some certifying agent will determine the available quantity. The intermediary or developer sells these certificates to um, carbon market participants. Well, what happens when the project fails? Who loses and what have they lost? In the way the voluntary carbon markets work today, when you buy carbon removals or you buy carbon removal certificates, you in essence wave them around the room to say, look at me, I bought these things, and then you immediately tear them up and throw them away. The technical term in the voluntary carbon market for tearing them up and throwing them away is retirement. When you buy these certificates and you retire them, you are no longer responsible for either, um, you're, you're, you're sort of acknowledging you don't own an asset, you are not monitoring what's going on with this project, the registry doesn't monitor what's going on with the project. And frankly, the project manager or project developer breathes a sigh of relief because they collected their cash and they are off the hook for anything. If we compare this to financial market uncertainty. So I gave a couple of examples of headlines from The Guardian as well. But what happens is in financial markets, people buy assets to generate revenues, meet current or future liabilities. These assets are risky. There's mark to market on the assets um, at regular intervals, like stocks, you know, they, they mark to market minute by minute, day by day. Um, and if something goes deeply wrong with these assets, these assets become what is called impaired or the assets are written down. And to the degree the owner of these assets have a long-term obligation, they have to replace the assets. So think about this distinction between carbon markets and financial markets. In financial markets, if something goes wrong with your asset, you declare, I have a problem with my asset. You tell your investors, and if you need the asset, you replace it. If you have liabilities that have to be matched with it, that are being matched by that asset, you need to acquire new liabilities. In the voluntary carbon markets, we simply say, hey, I bought it. Now I put it aside and I never think about it again. So I want to focus in this context on one particular 
um, principle from a paper I wrote with uh, two co-authors co around called uh, Accounting for Carbon Offsets. What, we're do what we did in this paper is we um, sort of applied the fundamental core principles of how accounting works to say, this is the way the carbon carbon trading markets need to work. But for the purposes of this discussion, to tie it back to uh, Kate and her team's work, what I want to talk about is simply this idea that says, if we're talking about things that are actual assets, we need to understand the idea that assets are impaired or accreted based on new information. So the, the carbon markets today basically say, ex ante, we determine how many carbon credits are generated by a project. And instead of saying that number moves up or down based on new information, we, the market just ignores that concept. So a registry says, we will register this many uh, certificates, we will allow the trading of those certificates, and then we will allow people to retire those certificates based on those numbers, and no, no new information gets incorporated into this process. So um, Kate had um, this wonderful slide that I asked Abby if she could slip in um, because I hadn't seen it before, but it was her slide 19. So what this page is showing you perfectly is that the current VCM says that enhanced, tries to pretend that enhanced weathering is riskless. They peg how many certificates they were, will sell at that lower bar, and the enhanced weathering just continues to grow. Similarly, on the biochar side, they're pegging, the current VCM line says, they're pegging biochar as being a riskless asset, even though it isn't. Instead of tracking exactly how this information flows and how the, tr the tradable asset that is captured carbon changes through time, they simply say, we're going to set a level and we're going to trade it. Okay, now if we could go back to um, my section again. Beautiful. Thank you. So next slide. Okay, so what we're trying to do in some of the work within SFI, which is connecting the scientific basis for the um, various uh, methods of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, we have um, what I describe as these three different paths to deal with carbon market problems. So the first, I guess, that we just sort of describe as open versus closed systems. So you could think of closed systems as direct air capture and mineralization. It's sort of the cleanest and most easy to document. In essence, when we do direct air capture, we know exactly how much carbon has been captured. If we take that, um, uh, pump it underground into a system where it will mineralize, we have a uh, near perfect understanding <clears throat> of the number of tons of CO2 that we capture, and assuming the, the mineralization occurs, there's essentially no chance of reversibility. This is a closed system where we might even get to such specific understandings and structures in carbon markets where we can trade title to physically capture carbon. On the other hand, biochar and enhanced weathering are happening sort of in the wild. We'll call that an open system. So the question is, how do we deal with something that we want to have trade in an open system where there's actually no real um, clean way to claim who owns it? You can't, don't even necessarily know where it is, but how do we account for ownership of something like that that is out in nature? Second point about the the issues about carbon markets here is what I would describe as some sort of process risk, which is, does the enhanced weathering successfully capture? How much does the biochar degrade? So this is um, 
again, in my non-scientific explanation, I think about this as something like moving from the laboratory into the field. We may know how the process works in the laboratory. How does it, how does it move from science experiment in lab to engineering exercise in the field? That is one set of um, uh, uncertainty concerns. A second set of uncertainty concerns are these MRV risks. And again, when what, what um, Brian and Lexi have described are all of these uncertainties around MRV as it exists today. And we can hope and ex fully expect and hope that these measurement methods and technologies will improve, decrease in cost, et cetera. But all of this amounts to changing that curve of the riskiness of how we actually evaluate how much carbon has been captured and how much can trade. So this ties back to this accounting question of accretions versus impairments. So we can say, even if we had a perfect understanding of how enhanced weathering works in the field, how does biochar degrade in the field, we still have to understand um, what's the most cost-effective methods to use and how are we going to integrate that into the process that says assets that we trade accrete or impair over time? And so what we're really trying to do is connect the riskiness of these processes into, into the riskiness of a market that trades. So instead of saying, for example, thinking back to, to the earlier slide, um, when... Um, when today the market practice says, I'm going to take incredibly conservative numbers on how much carbon is actually going to be captured, what I'm really doing is imposing unnecessary costs on the carbon markets, on the people who are developing these projects, because I'm never going to give them credit. I have no mechanism to give them credit for the things they're doing well that we might know more about in the future. Similarly, I'm pretending that there's no risk to the things that we know are very risky exercises because of this re with this bug of the voluntary carbon market that says, I buy a carbon removal certificate, I announce that I have it, and then I retire it. So I no longer care whether I have carbon. I no longer care whether the, the, you know, the carbon accretes or impairs over the next you know, N number of years. So what we're thinking about is testing a path forward that says and again, I think it was Brian who mentioned this, that there are some concerns over um, whether the people who are in, involved in the activity of the carbon capture should have anything to do with the people who are making the decisions about how much carbon is captured. This is a very funny thing to have going on in financial markets. Carbon markets seem to think that would be allowed. In financial markets, that would generally be considered fraud. So what we're thinking about for trying to implement this is imagine if we had a, um, a sort of automated agent, you know, AI driven or purely mechanical that understands all of the, st the state of the art of technology of what's going on in these natural processes, how the different MRV technologies interact with each other and evolve. This process could simply be responsible for declaring in an unambiguous and trusted way how much carbon has been removed by a given project at any point in time. So, for example, you can imagine this process, you know, points to a biochar project in the Midwest that's doing soil amendments in the United States, and it's going to declare on a quarterly basis how much carbon has actually been removed by that project. That agent that's doing MRV then simply declares that number to another agent that says it is responsible for allocating that carbon. So for example, you know, when a project is set up, 
and 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 the project says, fine, here's a ton that's going to reduce. We're going to allocate a million tons of carbon as removals. And over time, as we collect more and more information and we see how that number goes up, goes down, maybe it has trend to it, maybe it doesn't. But what it's going to do is continuously update. The only way that continuous updating works is if the buyers of these certificates don't retire them. Because again, just to think back to this comparison to carbon markets versus financial markets, if I'm an investor in financial markets and I buy something and I'm just going to claim, you know, I bought it, tell everyone I bought it, and then I throw it away, I retire the you know, knowledge of ownership. It isn't really a thing. It's not on my balance sheet. It's not an asset. I'm not responsible for it. If all of a sudden when I'm buying carbon credits, I'm saying, okay, I have a ton of carbon here. And guess what? A year from now, it might not be worth one ton of carbon. It might be down to 0.8 tons, or it could actually be up to 1.2 tons, depending on how the risk of the carbon capture process plays out over time. This is a very important point if we tie this back to where Tom started our conversation to say, if I'm talking about carbon removals as an actual asset that I need to own, that is defeasing a liability I have for my emissions. If I emit a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere, I ought to have an obligation to own a ton of CO2 removals. This is the only way we can make carbon budgets work, but we have to figure out means to integrate the riskiness of both the removal technology and our ability to measure the removals. And that's what we see as a path forward to a higher functioning carbon market. 